In preparation for the UN-sanctioned plebiscite of February 11, 1961, the United Nations Plebiscite Commissioner published the infamous Two Alternatives document that defined the stark choices that lay before Southern Cameroon achieving independence by joining the independent countries to the east or west, Cameroon or Nigeria. While neither of these two alternatives spoke for the true choices of the people, Southern Cameroons had little leverage to change the script that the United Kingdom, France and the Republic of Cameroon had written concerning its right to self-determination. Those two alternatives came to define the history of the people of Southern Cameroons for many decades. Fast forward to 2018. Southern Cameroons, which today comprises the northwest and southwest regions of the Republic of Cameroon, is now openly and unapologetically called Ambazonia. There is a lot of talk about negotiations, inclusive dialogue, a ceasefire, as ways to resolve the rapidly escalating war in Ambazonia. Both sides of the conflict, the government of the Republic of Cameroon and the representatives of and the people of Ambazonia, have been throwing out preconditions and ideas for these future debates. The government and the majority of the people of the Republic of Cameroon consider this war a national matter that shall be resolved internally in Yaoundé. They consider this conflict the result of bad governance, a problem that afflicts the whole nation in general, and they acknowledge that though there are issues of marginalization of the predominantly English-speaking regions, these regions' problems are similar to other regions' problems across Cameroon. On the other hand, the majority of the people of Ambazonia no longer consider this an internal or national issue and have gone past the simple issues of marginalization of the predominantly English-speaking minority. Pushed to the wall, the people of Ambazonia are fighting for their lives and crying out for help over the unfolding genocide and ethnic cleansing happening in their land. The people of Ambazonia know their problems are not the same as the other eight regions of the Republic of Cameroon. They know they had and continue to have a special status under international law as a people with a distinct heritage and territory. They know that the war of Ambazonia is not about English-speaking versus French-speaking people. It's an economic war, as are all wars. It's about access to and control of resources under the soil of Ambazonia. Knowing that the issue is deeply rooted in international law, the people of Ambazonia are seeking an international solution to the ongoing war, a solution that will last for generations to come and one that will guarantee peace and prosperity for both Ambazonia and the Republic of Cameroon. Although the Cameroon government has sworn it will not change its form of government as a means to solve this crisis. Cracks are beginning to appear in its tough stand, and some within its ranks are now entertaining the much dreaded word. Federation. But the most dreaded word in these pre-negotiation times, and the word that is giving the Republic of Cameroon the most heartburn, and causing it to avoid negotiations, is actually... Independence. The independence of Ambazonia. Independence is what Ambazonia wants, deserves, and has promised to fight to the end for. Ambazonia's deafening calls for outright independence are legally and factually based on the passage of United Nations Resolution 1608 on April 21, 1961, granting to the Trust Territory of Southern Cameroons independence by joining the independent country of Cameroon. To anyone who is quick to point out that the UN-sanctioned plebiscite of February 11, 1961 was not about achieving independence simply, but rather about achieving independence by joining an independent nation, the laughable but legally defensible response is, a territory cannot achieve independence by joining an independent nation. It can only achieve self-government by joining an independent nation. For one simple fact, in international law, the word independence is unambiguous and unconditional. 
independence is most certainly not limited to freedom from white colonial control or administration. Independence means freedom from all control, influence, support, aid of other sovereign countries, unless through mutually agreed treaties of union or association. So why then didn't the United Kingdom and United Nations phrase the plebiscite question as, do you wish to achieve self-government by joining the independent nation of Cameroon? Quite simple, it was a bait and switch tactic. The UK and UN promised independence when they actually meant self-government in order to make the choices appear more attractive and to mislead the people that independence was a remote possibility when in fact, it was not. Why bring up the argument for independence 57 years after the passage of the UN resolution when throughout the decades the people of southern Cameroons have been living within the Republic of Cameroon? Because on good faith, the people of southern Cameroons had decided that despite the odds, and certainly not out of foolishness or a lack of understanding, they would work to build a nation with their brothers in the Republic of Cameroon in 1961. However, the Republic of Cameroon, out of an abundance of arrogance and self-righteousness, implemented its own bait-and-switch tactic in 1972. The dissolution of the Federation and the removal of all protective safeguards for the English-speaking minority in Cameroon. The Republic of Cameroon had only accepted a federal system of government to appease the people of southern Cameroons into voting affirmatively for Cameroon in the crooked 1961 plebiscite. Others asked, why bring up the independence debate for southern Cameroons in 2018 when northern Cameroons was happy to join Nigeria on June 1, 1961? Because the terms of union of northern Cameroons with Nigeria were clearly spelled out and signed off by the United Kingdom and Prime Minister Tafawa Balewa of Nigeria. They were night and day compared to Southern Cameroon's transfer to the Republic of Cameroon. Southern Cameroon's certainly got the stepbrother inheritance. So the big debate today is, how does Southern Cameroon's fulfill its goal of achieving independence in future negotiations? First of all, it is important to acknowledge that not all people from southern Cameroons support the option of outright independence for a number of reasons. Some have investments or live or work in the Republic of Cameroon. Some have strong family ties across the Mongo River. Some think less extremist or radical positions should be explored instead of independence. Some don't have a house in or have lost touch with their southern Cameroons roots and want to let sleeping dogs lie. As absurd as it may sound, some don't like the name Ambazonia. A fraction of the people from southern Cameroons prefer to solve the problem by reverting to a federation. There are three problems with this alternative. The government will not willingly revert to a federal structure of government unless it is forced to. Even if a federation is eventually welcome, what kind of federation would you ask for? Two-state federation like in 1961? 10-state federation by converting every region to a state? In every scenario in which a federation becomes a possible solution, the numbers will be stacked against southern Cameroons and equality will never be achieved. Talk less of independence. A federation is a system of government where relative populations and therefore representation gives power to states. In 1961, based on the relative populations of the Southern Cameroons and the Republic of Cameroon, Southern Cameroons was assigned only 10 out of 50 members of Parliament. As much as Southern Cameroons was equal to the Republic of Cameroon on paper, and somewhat in the 1961 Federal Constitution, the reality on the ground was far from one of equal partners. Therefore, a return to a federal system of government would be cosmetic at best and for most indications, would most likely end up as a 10-state federation. One thing is crystal clear. A federation with the Republic of Cameroon, in any shape or form, would be an extremely poor choice for Ambazonia. A federation, no matter how masterfully created, will fall short of the expectations and dreams of southern Cameroons. A federation will bring dishonor to the people who have made the ultimate sacrifice and created the leverage on ground zero that has turned the tide against the Republic of Cameroon's tyrannical 57-year rule. A federation would grant southern Cameroons only very constrained self-government within the new Federal Republic of Cameroon. 
On the flip side, the argument for outright independence is strongly rooted in international law and the lack of the implementation of the now famous UN Resolution 1608. Ignoring Article 2 of the resolution, which cleverly but falsely attributes the redefinition of independence to mean joining to the people of Southern Cameroons, the real outstanding issue is Article 5. That the implementation of the agreed and declared policies of Southern Cameroons and the Republic of Cameroon. With the conspicuous absence of the UK, Southern Cameroons did not have the leverage to negotiate as equals with the Republic of Cameroon, a sovereign nation, and never entered into a contract or agreement or treaty to extend the Republic of Cameroon's boundaries beyond the Mongo River. The Federal Constitution of 1961 was not a contract. Even if one argued it was, it was never signed by both Southern Cameroons and the Republic of Cameroon. The boundary and definition of the Republic of Cameroon at the United Nations has not been legally updated since September 20th, 1960, when it was formally admitted to the UN. So how come it now extends to the border with Nigeria? What legal instrument was created with the consent of the people of Southern Cameroons to extend that boundary past the River Mongo? Southern Cameroons therefore has a choice of three legal battles before it. The 1959 legal battle would be to not only retroactively challenge the basis of the need in 1959 for a plebiscite in determining the future of Southern Cameroons, but also the choice of questions and misleading legal language employed to describe those options to the people of Southern Cameroons. The 1960 legal battle is the retroactive implementation of UN Resolutions 1514 and 1541, granting immediate and unconditional independence to all non-self-governing territories still under colonial rule. The risk of this legal argument is the fact that Southern Cameroons was already locked onto a certain legal path by December 1960. The third and easiest legal battle of 1961 would be to push for the proper implementation of Article 5 of UN Resolution 1608 to the satisfaction of both Southern Cameroons and the Republic of Cameroon. The most often discussed options for implementation of Article 5 are 1. Outright independence of Southern Cameroons and 2. The return to a federation with the Republic of Cameroon. However, one of the least talked about alternatives is the creation of a confederacy with the Republic of Cameroon. Let's examine the option of a confederacy. A confederacy is an alternative that could grant sovereignty to Southern Cameroons while preserving Southern Cameroons' rights to negotiate mutually beneficial short and long-term economic and financial agreements as part of a treaty of union. Let's take a look at one of the more popular confederacies in the world which ironically happens to be the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The UK is a country made up of four countries, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Each of these countries has their sovereign governments, capital cities, national flags, national anthems, militaries, and local police forces. As opposed to a federation, the UK is a loose association of four countries that are bound together by a general central government, common overarching values, and shared national initiatives. Though the UK as a country maintains a central bank, each country in the UK issues its own banknotes in the same currency against its respective reserves in the UK central bank. Though international relations and diplomacy are shared initiatives, each UK country still has the power and ability to strengthen and develop themselves, their economy, and their interests on the world stage and encourage foreign businesses to invest locally. Most importantly, each country in the UK maintains their sovereignty, including their right to secede, as evidenced by Scottish referendum of 2014. The right of a part of a country to secede is usually based on whether it is suffering serious forms of abuse. This is the view invoked in the world's most famous secessionist document, the U.S. Declaration of Independence. The declaration states that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Southern Cameroons certainly has had its train of abuses, one that is 57 carriages or years long, justifying its long-standing claim to sovereignty. On the surface, a confederacy with the Republic of Cameroon looks like a good option for Southern Cameroons to explore in preparation for upcoming negotiations. 
A confederacy would bring the promise for Southern Cameroons to define its flag, its national languages and anthem, its system of government, its national day, and more. It could allow Southern Cameroons to resolve long-term financial obligations, for example pension plans, existing capital investments, energy generation and consumption, and more. It could allow for Southern Cameroons to build up its national police and military forces. All of these could all be done from the position that Southern Cameroons is a sovereign nation within a confederacy that reserves the right to exit the loose association with the Republic of Cameroon by way of referendum every so often, based on the health of the Union. Ironically, a confederacy is the form of a union that could fulfill the crooked language of the UN plebiscite and UN Resolution 1608, or 15, of 1961. Do you wish to achieve independence by joining the independent country of the Republic of Cameroon? Because in a confederacy, both Southern Cameroons and the Republic of Cameroon could maintain their respective sovereignties while agreeing by union treaty on common areas of interest and shared authority. This is exactly what John Gu Fancha fought for and lost at the June 1961 tripartite constitutional meeting when the UK sided with Aijo. As good as a confederacy looks from afar, there's one very dark cloud hovering over it. The issue of the fiscal currency of Cameroon, the franc, CFA, and the fact that the Republic of Cameroon does not have a central bank, but rather shares one with four other Central Africa countries. The franc CFA is not printed in Cameroon, it's printed in France. The CFA originally stood for French Colonies of Africa, then French Community of Africa, and finally, Financial Community of Africa. Regardless of the successive name changes, the franc CFA remains a colonial currency controlled by the French government. In order for Southern Cameroons to be able to control its monetary policies, it cannot use the franc CFA, else it would be under the control of France. But to ask the Republic of Cameroon to drop the franc CFA would be asking for a lot, and frankly, would mean fighting in the wrong war. For this reason, the idea of a confederacy, while great, would be impractical and not achieve the expected results in the long run. Therefore, on any future negotiating roundtable with Sisiku, Mancho, Bixi, and others, leaders chosen by the people of Southern Cameroons to represent them, Southern Cameroons should choose wisely. Independence of Southern Cameroons, the option the UN and UK denied Southern Cameroons in the 1961 plebiscite guarantees the best long-term outcome for the people of Southern Cameroons. A confederacy, while attractive on the surface, comes with a hefty price tag of financial servitude, one that would essentially erase the power of the confederation in the long run. A federation, the worst option for Southern Cameroons, would fail to deliver for Southern Cameroons even before the ink of the signatures have dried on paper.